Welcome to Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast where myself, Mitch, and my co-host Brad talk about news stories from the past week from across the internet and the movies that we think resemble them. So, you know, new week, uh, new set of stories, new movies to talk about, you know, let's get right into it. I'm excited. So, you know, the question I kind of posed this week as the host was what was the first R-rated movie you got to see? You know, whether it was in theaters, home video, you know, because everyone kind of remembers this because it was a moment where it's like, you know, you feel more grown up and it's it's almost like stuff you're not supposed to see, you know, that's kind of been guarded from you. It's it's an exciting feeling. So, you know, I want to hear yours first and then we'll get to mine. Right on. Yeah, man, that's a good question, man. Good, good question because as soon as you sent it, I immediately knew the movie. It was... uh I think it was 1993. I was at a friend's house spending the night and uh, we were, he had the movie channels. We were in his basement and on came Demolition Man. The Demolition Man was the first R-rated movie I ever saw. And it's, I love it. I remember um, my father saw it in theaters and it was one of his favorites. Um, so, so it's always been, it was, it was one of those I wanted to see always. So getting to see that when I was that young and, I think it was the first movie nudity I saw, obviously, because there's one scene in it where the woman like accidentally pops on screen and she's naked for like two seconds. And I remember me and my buddy, because we were young and mature, and it was like the first nudity we had seen in a movie. We paused it and we just busted out laughing for some reason. And his mom opened up the basement door. Was like, "Are you guys all right down there?" And we were like, "Yeah." And then she shut the door and. That's just one of those vivid memories I have from the first time I ever saw Demolition Man, which was the first R-rated movie I ever saw. It's a good answer. You know, um, mine is a little bit similar where, you know, the first R-rated movie I saw and, you know, it was actually I had trouble remembering which one was correct. And I think this is the right answer. But um, the first R-rated movie I saw was Species 2. Not even the first one, the second one, um, you know, and that is, I think, a really good example of an R-rated movie because it's got everything that you would want out of an R-rated movie. It has, you know, blood and guts and, you know, uh, sci-fi horror elements to it. And it's full of gratuitous nudity, you know, so it's like getting to see that after, you know, a life of like PG-13 and under before that, it was just you know, it blows you away a little bit, but you know, that movie is, is something else for the R rating. I never saw species two. I saw species one, but did you know, have you ever seen a movie at Snowden river parkway? Have you ever seen that United artist? It sounds familiar. I probably have because the road sounds familiar. So I probably have sure. So there's a movie theater on Snowden. Well, if you've ever seen a movie there, then you have seen a movie where Species 2 was filmed. Because before they actually filled that movie theater with the theater, they used that theater. There's a scene in the movie where there's a bunch of alien pods or alien eggs or something. And that shot was shot at that building. So our first story from this past week here, if you've been following music news or entertainment, it's a relatively big story where the duo Daft Punk split up after 28 years together of making music. And it's crazy because, you know, you hear about a band or a musical group that's been around that long. And it just, you know, I didn't even realize it was 28 years. But, you know, I think at some point everyone has liked or at least known of some Daft Punk songs. I love Daft Punk. I own uh, all their CDs. Um, their CD, a lot. Their live CD is called a Live uh, 2000. Uh, it's a Live, a Live 2008 or something. Oh, it's called a Live. Anyway, uh, I love Daft Punk. So uh, their CD, a Live. Is it's a live CD they put out a while ago, and that's I listen to that CD more than probably any CD I own. It's such a good CD, and it's they they take it's pretty much like a, it's like a, you know it's a live CD, so it's like a greatest hits album, but it like combines tracks and like does different arrangements and everything, and uh, it's it's one of the best albums I have, and I listen to it all the time. And uh, the epilogue, did you actually watch the epilogue video they put out? 
No, I actually read the description of it, but no, I'm with you where Daft Punk, you know, the music that they made was not by the book. It wasn't the same thing that everybody else was doing. It was different. They, you know, kind of helped usher in, I feel like a little bit of electronic music, you know, in this day and age and maybe inspired some people along the way. So yeah, they're, they're definitely out there a little bit. Yeah. 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 I, I thought that blog video was really cool. Um, it plays into my selection and I, I have a note too, which is, it may be your selection. I'm not sure. I, hopefully I'm not treading on your movie selection, but the Tron legacy score for me is like one of the all time greatest film scores. I absolutely love that score. Yeah. So, you know, I might as well just say it then the, the movie that I picked is indeed Tron legacy. And obviously, for those of you who don't know, that's because Daft Punk did the entire soundtrack to the um, to the movie. They did the score and all the electronic beats and everything that you hear in that movie was created by Daft Punk. So, you know, I know a lot of people really love that soundtrack. I like it. You know, it's not one of my favorites for any movie ever, but I definitely could still kind of put it on in the background and just listen to it as nice, easy listening. But it's still you know, it's got a beat to it. It, you know, kind of pumps you up a little bit, but you know, Tron legacy. I, I enjoyed watching this. I saw this in theaters and I think maybe that that helps with the movie because it's a movie that you'd really enjoy seeing on the big screen, you know, all the different visuals to it. And, you know, I really don't see that many people out there online when this movie is mentioned that really hate it. I see a lot of people who thought it was either okay or they really liked it. And, hoped that Disney would make a sequel to it, but it seems like that may never happen or they may just reboot it again with different story, different people. So I think it's a solid movie. I think it's visually super impressive and it's still very unique and very um, visually impressive. And, you know, the story is, is, is okay. You know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward story, but you know, I think it's a great modern update on the, 80s Tron movie that a lot of people grew up with in the past. I I absolutely love Tron Legacy. I love the original Tron. Um, the score for that movie, like I just said, one of my favorites of all time. The, the track Fall is like for me, it's like one of the greatest pieces of music ever made. Mix that with Derezzed from that movie, it's just so good. And they even the album was so successful, they did a uh, remix album where like other artists took on tracks from the movie and remember and remix them and stuff great album as well and, and so a bit of story for tron legacy with me was <clears throat> the day this is how pathetic i am when it comes to buying movies the day i was set to move to la okay i was i was in maryland and i was set to move to la and the car was packed i would not leave until after I went to the store and bought Tron Legacy on uh, the 3D Blu-ray that came out because I wanted to make sure I owned it before I drove to LA so that when I got to LA and set up my 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 apartment I could watch Tron Legacy on video first thing so that's that's how pathetic I am the biggest move of my life I had to wait until I could buy the movie <laughs> but I love it dude it's it's the 3D in it is probably some of the best 3D of, of any movie I love I don't know if you noticed or if you saw it in theaters but it's one of the movies that does shifting aspect ratios it goes from a two three five to an IMAX full full you know I, I can't say I noticed that before but now I'm not going to be able to unsee it you know it's <laughs> it's it's uh, I love IMAX framing I love the movies that shift aspect ratios uh, Nolan does it all the time Michael Bay does it but it's like in, in the Tron movie, it's when he enters the world of Tron or the world of, of the Internet. And when the when the ships are coming down, it like spans the full screen. And oh man, if you see those on a true IMAX screen, it is some of the most amazing. I, I love it so much. But Tron, Tron Legacy, man, I can watch that movie. It's one of those movies I can watch all the time. I love it. And I don't know, like you said, if it is a true sequel or if they are rebooting it i think it might be like one of those requel type things but jared leto is slated to make a neutron movie right yeah I, now that you mention it i i do remember that and yeah i, I don't know if this is going to be a sequel to tron legacy or if it's going to be you know another reboot and it's a shame because you know i really like the foundation that they laid with tron legacy and 
it's a shame that it seems like they might kind of throw that away. So we'll see how this one with Jared Leto shapes up. We'll see, but in Leto, I trust, man. That guy's a great actor. So my movie is actually, so backstory, because that's what I like to give. When people see or hear that I have a, a DVD Blu-ray collection of like almost 5,000 titles, the one question I always get is, have you ever bought a movie that you just never watched? And so my selection was mentioned in the article because it is a movie I bought 10 to 15 years ago when it first came out, but never sat down to watch it until yesterday. And that is Daft Punk's Electroma. The Daft Punk, it's a shiny steel. It's in like 2006, 2000, something like that. But it's like, I watched it yesterday. It's like this. So the, the epilogue clip actually comes from Electroma <clears throat> where they're walking through the desert. But then, um, you know, after they blow up, it kind of cuts to like they put in a, a track from um, from their uh, most recent album, which was the the one that won um, album of the year, uh, Random Access Memory. And so they put in touch. Great track. dude. I love that track. And uh, but this movie, it's like real artsy fartsy. It's like no it's a silent film, it has no dialogue at all. And it's just about two uh, two robots in a robot world who are trying to become human. And 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 the weird thing is, no Daft Punk music. The soundtrack of the movie is not Daft Punk. So break it down for me a little bit. Is this a movie? Was it directed or produced by the guys from Daft Punk? You said that it didn't have any of their music in it. You know, does it have a soundtrack? You know, is it a full length movie? You know, what what for people that may not know, because I've never heard of this, you know, what's, right, what's, yeah. the, what's the deal with this movie? So it's an hour and 15 minute movie. So it is a, it's, that is considered anything over 90s feature, anything over 80 or 70 really is feature. Um, it has a soundtrack, not a ton of music, because a lot of it is just the sounds of them driving or the sounds of them walking or, or like wind, you know, real, real artsy type stuff. Uh, it was directed by the guys of Daft Punk's written and directed by them. I looked on Rotten Tomatoes, the ratings for it, pretty high. I think it had like an over 60% rating on it. So, you know, and I, I can say I enjoyed it. You know, I say artsy fartsy, and sometimes it's like, eh, it's artsy fart. I enjoyed it. You know, it's it's a weird movie. They go to like some like weird doctor who like puts like a, a clay face on them or like a, a, a some type of like Play Doh type face on them that which looks like I don't know if you're familiar garbage pail kids. But it kind of looks like the garbage pail kids type faces. And then it's like they go in the desert and they walk, and it's really it's it kept my attention. For, and it's a silent film, but it, it kept my attention. And, and yeah, the music is like, it's got like a score for parts, which I, I don't think it wasn't any recognizable Daft Punk music. And when I looked it up, one of the reviewers said it, the, none of the music was Daft Punk. And so when I watched it, I noticed none of it was anything. I know it wasn't electronic. -y. It was kind of like chorestral. Is that, if that's a word, you know, choral, you know, if that's a word. So it's, if, if you if you like Daft Punk and you like kind of weird movies like that, I, I would I would say check it out. The cool thing is I looked this up on eBay. Not a lot of these out there. This thing goes for like 80 bucks on eBay and there's only like two of them on there. So I got a nice collector's edition with this. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm just a fan of Daft Punk and I am bummed we're not going to get any new Daft Punk music, man. Yeah, at least we have uh, a pretty good catalog of stuff to fall back on that they've made in the past to listen to. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of people will be missing Daft Punk over the over the years now. But, you know, we still have the soundtrack from Tron Legacy. We still have other stuff from them. So we still got our, our fix, you know. Yeah, and if you have the chance to check out, it's Alive 2007 is the album. It, one of the best albums ever made. All right, so my first story up is a story that you may have missed. I only saw it because Stephen Colbert does a, a segment on his show called Meanwhile, where he does like stories that you probably have never heard of, and this was one of them. And it's a story about how they have made 3D printer, 3D printed 
steaks that you can eat, like legitimate steaks. And uh, I don't know. I saw I, I was pretty disgusted. Uh, I don't know how you felt. How did you feel when you read the article? Um, you know, when I saw the headline, 3D printed steak, basically to sum it up, I thought, okay, it's a steak made out of plastic. You know, you, you think of a 3D printer and it's like, you know, it does all the little things and it's, it's plastic. But, you know, when you read it, they, they take um, like, a, like a protein or an enzyme, basically. And I can't remember if it's uh, an animal one, but basically they uh, grow it in a plant-based matrix and it just kind of and they add other things to it as well and it basically takes the shape of and tastes like the real thing like steak so i thought okay i'll give that a try you know if it looks like steak and tastes like steak then you know who cares about what the difference is and you know obviously it does a lot for the environment that we're able to kind of create this instead of you know uh the Whole, the, like the whole conversation, like it's a longer conversation, but, you know, with cows and, you know, saving the environment with consuming less meat. So, you know, I'm not opposed to something like this. I thought it was interesting. Yeah. So that's, uh, the article says they use a, uh, a, a an animal cell. So they're taking cells from live animals and from that they're extracting and, cre- and creating actual meat that resembles uh, the tenderness and all that of actual cuts of, of, of steak. And, and so I had a question was one, have you ever had, you're a meat eater, right? Have you ever eaten like a beyond burger or anything like those? Yeah. Um, you know, those things are all the rage today and the article kind of mentions it where, you know, people and even more so during the pandemic have really taken to plant-based, you know, faux meat diets and, you know, I've tried uh, a handful of different kind of plant-based burgers and they pretty much do taste like the real thing, except they're, you know, a little bit better for you. Not as much better as people would think, you know, they're not infinitely better for you, but, you know, even like that little bit of difference where it is slightly healthier for you, I thought, okay, if it looks like a burger, it tastes like a burger, but it's slightly better for you. Why not kind of take that option? Yeah, man. So when I was reading this and everything, the reason I picked this article was I just was like thinking about, all right, what movies would go with this? And the only thing I could think of was cannibal movies. And so I think I went with another movie that you probably have never heard of, but it was, are you familiar with Trey Parker and Matt Stone? Do you know the name? Yeah. Creators of South Park. All right. So their very first movie before South Park, before anything, they were still in college. is something called Cannibal the Musical. And it's a movie about apparently in the 1800s, there was a prospector named um, Alfred Packer and he's a real person and he was suspected of cannibalism. <clears throat> so Trey, Trey Parker heard the story and was, and wrote an entire musical comedic musical around that premise. And they made this movie for a uh, hundred thousand dollars because what they originally did was they filmed a trailer and then the trailer got shown around the campus. And when the trailer made its way to like the head of the film department at Colorado State University at Boulder, which is where they, I know a lot about them right now because I just did a, a Team America script for the Joe Blow channel. Check it out. Um, but so the got to the head, head of the thing and the guy loved it so much. He told him, you know, turn this into a feature length movie. It's a hilarious movie. Trey Parker and Matt Stone for me are like heroes of mine. I, I absolutely love their their writing, any any movie, play, whatever they do. The only Broadway play I've ever seen, Book of Mormon. It's like the greatest thing ever. So check it out. Yeah, it, um, it definitely sounds like something that those guys would make. You know, it kind of has that like offbeat, you know, maybe a little bit kind of like crude humor style that those guys have. You know, like it, it definitely sounds like something that would kind of fit inside an episode of South Park, you know, where the the guys, you know, make like a, a musical about cannibalism or something for school. So, um, you know, it sounds pretty wacky, you know, like both your movie picks so far pretty out there. So, you know, round of applause for that. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny with this uh, story, it almost kind of makes me think of Jurassic Park, where you take almost kind of like the base DNA of an animal and you kind of grow it from there into like the real thing. But that's not that's not what I picked <laughs> for this. My first thought was, you know, a nice steak um you know like a nice you know gourmet meal kind of thing and it made me think of all the uh different 
kind of vain food dishes from my movie pick, which is American Psycho. And, you know, I say that because in the movie, they, they have a lot of, you know, like the uh, really expensive, really like they go into detail about all the different food dishes that the characters eat. And, you know, it instantly kind of made me think of that. Like, and, you know, American Psycho is uh, it's a really interesting movie. And I think, you know, they did a pretty good adaptation of the book that it was based on. But at the end of the day, it wasn't taking everything from the book. And it sounds like, cause I did some research on the book too. And you know, the differences between the movie and the book, and it sounds like the book goes a lot more into it and covers like a lot more of the psychological aspect of what's going on in Patrick Bateman's mind. And, you know, to me, I, I really hope that they maybe redo this someday, you know, Christian Bale in the lead was great. And it's still a good movie from start to finish. But, you know, just really getting into that darker, you know, the more psychological aspect of it. And they get in, into that a little bit in the movie about what's real and what's not and, you know, his state of mind. But, you know, with the uh, narration that goes over the the movie from him. But, you know, I really hope they they really, you know, take the, the dark material that's in the book and, and explore it even more. Well, yeah, it's a great flick. Uh, it was directed by Mary Heron, <clears throat> who did the movie. She's one of those like female directors from '98 who made probably one of a, 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 one of the best movies of the '90s. I, I think American Psycho is, and it hasn't really been heard of too much from then, which gives credence to the whole women director thing. Man, she should have been out there directing big, big time movies because she's talented as hell. Um, and it's uh, so I'll ask you, I'll, I'll let you have final say on this. Can we discuss the ending? Because the question of the ending is one I ask people. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's it's a 20 something plus year old movie at this point. So, you know, if you really haven't seen it, but have an interest in seeing it, but haven't seen it yet, it's, you know, kind of on you. But yeah, it's 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 like we were talking about a, um, on a previous episode where the ending's kind of ambiguous. It kind of leaves you to draw your own conclusions and. You know, I I like going with the idea that everything actually happened and everyone is just kind of like too vain to, to notice or to take him seriously or to kind of put the pieces together themselves. So that's the kind of ending that I interpreted from that. You know, I don't know about you, but that's kind of what I was gleaning from that. Last time I saw it, which admittedly hasn't been in a while, it was an ending that it doesn't even hint either way, which drove me nuts because I could see it as it happened or I could see it as it was in his head. I remember leaning towards it was in his head because nobody cared at the end. Um, so I, I do. It's, it's one I need to watch again. They did make a sequel with um, Mila Kunis. I never saw it. No interest in seeing it. I love Mila Kunis, but I just have zero interest in watching it. But when you did the research for the book, does the book is the book ambiguous as well? Was that all? Was that part of the book as well? Yeah, kind of. Um, I can't say I read the book. I just kind of learned some information about it, so I can't say exactly how it ends. But you know, maybe one day I'll go back and I'll actually read the book in full. But you know, it kind of deals with him losing his grip on reality. So maybe it does kind of feed into an ambiguous ending where we're not really sure if it's all in his head or what actually mm -hmm. happened because he just kind of begins to lose his grip on sanity steadily in the book. So, you know, maybe it is unreliable where you don't really know what's real and what's not. So it seems like a really interesting read for sure. So the next story from the past week here is, you know, if you're kind of this person that keeps up on celebrity relationships and gossip and that kind of stuff, you know, relatively big engagement announcement was the fact that Aaron Rodgers and Shailene Cheyenne Woodley were getting engaged. And, you know, this was a little surprising to me because, you know, she, she always looks like she's a lot younger than she is. And Aaron Rodgers, because he's been in the league so long, seems like he should be older but, you know, they're only, I think, about seven-ish years apart, maybe. So, you know, good for them. They both got, obviously, really big careers and really big, you know, businesses with a lot of spotlights on them. So, you know, I'm sure this news really kind of shook up your world when you heard it, right? I mean, I was just in tears when I heard that Shailene Woodley and Aaron Rodgers were, were engaged. No, I, I do respect I couldn't have cared less. 
Yeah, I think um, Shailene Woodley was known for a lot. She kind of started in the spotlight with The Secret Life of the American Teenager TV show from, you know, the mid to late 2000s. And then obviously a lot of people know her from the Divergent series as well. She kind of headlined that movie series. But, you know, I'm just going to get right into my movie pick because examples like this are, you know, she's actually a really, a really talented actress when she's given good stuff to work with. So, you know, with that being said, my movie pick is The Spectacular Now, which is, if you've never heard of it, um, it's a little indie film. Uh, she stars in it along with Miles Teller. And it's a really kind of quiet, kind of coming of age story about learning who you are and trying to gr learn, you know, what you want out of life and kind of forging your own path separate from your parents or, your, you know, people that you've kind of grown up with. And, you know, it's a really kind of quiet indie coming of age story, but it's really well done because the small scale lets the actors really kind of stretch their, their abilities and, really kind of work off of each other and they're given kind of a good environment and material to kind of show off their acting ability. So, you know, I think they have a great kind of chemistry together on screen, the two of them. And, you know, it's a pretty low stakes story. It's not about saving the world or anything like that. It's just about, you know, growing up and finding out your identity and, you know, typical kind of coming of age story. But, you know, when it's done right, those can be the best times, best types of stories. So, you know, what do you think about this one? You know, did you like it, not like it? You know, what do you think? So first I want to touch on Divergent series. Uh, it drives me nuts that they didn't finish it. I don't read the books. I was enjoying the movies. The last one they split up into two for some dumb reason. The first part of it didn't do well in theater, so they never even filmed the second part. So I, who know, I don't have no idea how the story ended. It drives me nuts. I hope one day they maybe pick up to pick it up and finish it just so I can see the, the conclusion of that story. As for the spectacular now, I saw it. Don't remember it at all. It's going to be a short conversation. I don't remember one piece of information about that movie at all. I remember it was, it was good. I, remember, I don't have anything bad to say about it. Just don't remember it that well, which might be a bad thing to say about it. Well, I mean, you know, we talked about Miles Teller and his acting ability on a previous episode with Whiplash. So, you know, would you take my word for it that he gave a good performance in this? And, you know, when you have a movie kind of centered around him and now, you know, in, in this one, Sh Shan, Shailene Woodley, you know, would you agree that it kind of, you know, would be a good watch and kind of a well acted movie if those two are at the center? Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, oh, yeah. Then this, yeah, it's a early, it's one of those earlier movies that they that made them what they are today. You know, Miles Teller's in Top Gun Maverick and and Whiplash and all those because he was probably phenomenal and spectacular. Now, Shailene Woodley, she she really turned out those kind of independent. Uh, it might I don't even know if that's based off a book, but you know, like movies like that, like The Fault in the Stars, which was almost my pick, which is a great movie. I don't know if you saw Fault in the Stars. And The Descendants, I almost picked. She was phenomenal in The Descendants. So they're great, great actors. But, you know, that's one of those that might, I might throw on my list again to give it a watch because I haven't seen it in surprise since it came out. But uh, I guess if to move right into my pick was uh, I, I was going to go with the Shailene Woodley movie. But then I was like, you know, this is a movie about an engagement. And so... I picked a movie I hadn't seen in a while and I ended up watching it last night because I hadn't seen it in a while. And it was a really funny movie, the five year engagement. I don't know if you ever saw that, but this was around the time of like, you know, mid to late two thousands when like Judd Apatow was turning out those, you know, Jason Segal, you know, super bad, uh, uh, forgetting Sarah Marshall, you know, those, those types of movies, those R rated comedies. And this one was one that, kind of fell under the radar a little bit didn't get like i'm sure if you ask people now if you say five-year engagement they probably their eyes might gloss over which you seem to be doing i don't know do you actually remember the movie um i've heard of it i can't say i've seen it or really know much about it so you know with that being said you know where would you kind of rank this for people who haven't heard of it or seen it where would you kind of put this with the other judd up judd apatow movies you know where would you kind of rank this or put it alongside others to say it's kind of on on these other ones levels i mean i i watching it last night it's a genuinely funny movie i mean jason siegel is a funny 
he's a funny dude, man. And you can tell a lot of it is an improv type thing, which is like most Apatow flicks. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's nowhere near a forgetting Sarah Marshall, which is a top 10 comedy for me. I absolutely love forgetting Sarah Marshall, but it's like one of those movies where it's just like, it's, it's funny. It's a good watch. It is. It's, I watched, you know, it has an unrated cut. The unrated cut clocks in at two hours and 12 minutes. And so I, it got a little long, but not, not much. It did deter the enjoyment of the movie for me. And it's, it's a great movie because it has a lot of like early, it's like Chris Pratt, Allison Brie, Kevin Hart, Randall Park, um, you know, all these like big names now, like huge, massive names. This was like, they all had like kind of bit roles in this movie back then. And, and so it's, it's, it's one of those, you know, it, it, it it's, it's funny and, you know, it leads to that happy, you know, happy ending, you know, where you're like, you know, the little comedy tears. Um, but it's, it was a good, it's a good watch. All right. So next story I have is, uh, you know, with coronavirus going on, all the movie theaters shuttered last week. And so <clears throat> I picked, I picked this story. It's about Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York said that they're going to start okaying movie theaters to kind of slowly reopen at uh, 50 per- 50 people capacity um, in the movie theaters. Uh, mainly I picked this story just as to talk about, I wanted to just delve into missing going to the theaters. Uh, something I, I severely missed before coronavirus. Uh, I may have said before I, I'd go two, maybe three times a week <clears throat> to the theaters because I just, I enjoy seeing movies. Um, <clears throat> so what about you? How was your, how was your movie attendance before coronavirus? Um, you know, because movie uh, theater tickets and, you know, concessions, which I don't really get, you know, when I used to go because they, they are both just so expensive. Like, you know, I don't have the money to go see every movie. So it was almost kind of like a, a pick and choose kind of thing. If it was a movie I really wanted to see on the big screen or a movie where, you know, it was almost maybe a spur of the moment thing sometimes where I didn't know that much about it, but it was getting great reviews. I thought, okay, why not go see this in theaters while it's on the big screen? So, you know, it was kind of like a case by case basis for when I would go to the movies or what for, but you know, it wasn't super often, but it's always, you know, it's always an experience when you go and yeah, you know, we talked about it a little bit before in a previous episode where both of us kind of missed that, that experience, but you know, someday we will be able to do that someday soon, maybe. But you know, I'm not really in the mindset for going back to a movie theater for a while. You know, just indoor spaces. Not really until things get uh, better. So you know, I was thinking about movies. About what's a good movie about going to the movies? And for me, there is only one movie that celebrates going to the movies. Last Action Hero. Come on, that movie's like, it's one of the greatest things ever, man. It's like a Schwarzenegger making fun of like his image and everything. And it's, I mean, it's a movie fully about this kid in New York who just loves going to the movies. He goes to this little independently run theater, <clears throat> gets that magic ticket and gets to go inside his favorite, you know, film series, the Jack Slater film series. <clears throat> and it's from the director, Die Hard, John McTiernan, man. It's just freaking love that movie yeah i've um i've seen bits and pieces of this one but i can't say i've seen the the whole thing from start to finish but you know a lot of people kind of point to this as you know arnie kind of making fun of fun of himself a little bit and it kind of leads into you know his body of work after you know this time period where maybe he wasn't making as good of movies and you know, ones that he was in kind of did the same thing and poked fun at some of the earlier stuff that he did. So, you know, would you say this is maybe maybe like a turning point in his career where he maybe made some not as good stuff from the stellar movies that he made in like the late 80s, early 90s, you know, that it's kind of a symbolic turning point for his career? All right. So so Last Action Hero is a, is a it came out in 93. And it was a dud. It's it's a inf- kind of an infamous box office bomb where it was supposed to be this massive hit, and it kind of came and sit and, and fizzled in theaters or whatever. But it's one of those cult following movies. I don't think a lot of people hate this movie. I think a lot of people look back on it fondly. They love it because it is a good action movie. And so to to your point of what came after, 
I mean, just the next year, he was in True Lies, one of his greatest. He did Junior, 1994. Uh, you know, not one of his best, but it was. I, I enjoyed it for what it was. Eraser, Jingle All the Way came after that. So, you know, I think 90s, it looks like he may have, he may have started making he, – he wasn't as in demand as it seemed like he was in the 80s. And, you know, obviously 97, he gave the uh, Oscar snub performance of Mr. Freeze and Batman and Robin. <clears throat> but, yeah, late 90s to the early 2000s, it looked like he was turning out some duds, you know, collateral damage, the sixth day around – he did a – well, actually, because at that point, he was – um he was governor of, of California. That's why his pr- film production went down a little bit. But I, you know, I I personally love. I'm a I'm a Schwarzenegger fan. Or how about you? You 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 will you watch any Schwarzenegger? Well, I guess not any because you haven't seen Last Action Hero. But are you a Schwarzenegger fan? Yeah. Again, the good stuff that he's in, I'll absolutely watch it over and over again. I've said before that Terminator Two is probably my favorite action movie ever, and I'll happily debate with people who say that it's not, you know, but. Uh, the good stuff that he's in, absolutely. True Lies, I think it's another great action movie that he was in. Obviously, his more famous stuff, the Terminator, the early Terminator movies, not the later ones that he was in because those are, most of those are terrible. But, um, you know, the like we're talking about this time period of earlier in his career, obviously Twins and Kindergarten Cop and these good Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I'll happily watch those over and over again. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I looked. Yeah, to the the last term. I try to. I try to only speak good of movies on this podcast because I hope of working with some of these people one day. But the last term, and I was really looking forward to man the return of uh, Linda Hamilton, and I just could not get on board with that one. But hopefully, like you said, Twins. I love Twins, and there's been a long in development triplets movie where Eddie Murphy is supposed to come in as the triplet. I hope that gets made one day. I think we're kind of past that window. I think it may be an example of like Zoolander 2 where people want a sequel to a classic comedy, but be careful what you wish for. So I thought about, you know, doing the same thing, like picking a a movie about movies or going to the movies. But instead, I just because there's limitless possibilities with this because it's a story about movie theaters reopening. So instead, what I did was just kind of pick a movie that's, takes place in New York City. And I thought, what better film to, to talk about with this recent news of these Spider-Man 3 kind of you know things coming out that we talk about Into the Spider-Verse. And, you know, this movie, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, full title. But, um, you know, we haven't really talked about this one on, on the show yet. And, you know, I think it's, it's just a fantastic blend of all the things you want out of a good movie. It's got great uh, characters, a great story. Um, Because it looks so different and vibrant in its animation, visually, it's just phenomenal. It stands out from all the other animated movies these days. And, you know, it really brings a diverse cast of characters where, you know, we have a young, half black, half Hispanic teenager in the role of Spider-Man, which is a huge departure from the kind of Spider-Man that we have in the past. And, you know, he just kind of takes him and, pushes him in a direction that, you know, you can't help but but like his, his journey and his struggle and really root for him. And, you know, the soundtrack for this movie is really diverse and really different from other superhero movies as well. And I think this one, you know, we've talked at length about superhero movies before on the show, but, you know, this is one that I think really stands out these days and really deserves all the praise and recognition that it gets from, from viewers. Oh yeah, I, I'm a huge fan of Into the Spider Verse. I, I remember <clears throat> seeing that one in theaters, and yeah, the animation is, is is different. They created a new style of animation for that movie, I believe. Um, Phil Lord, Chris Miller, the guys who did Lego Movie and everything, they they were the producers on it, or whatever, and they they went on and won Best of Animated Feature at the Academy Awards. So, so technically, the first superhero movie to win. The major one of the major awards I consider best animated feature to be one of the major awards. So I think it's pretty good. Then I, I voiced acting is phenomenal. You got um, 
uh, Marshall Ali, you got uh, Brian Tyree Henry, who is quickly becoming one of my favorite actors. I, I'm, I'm not sure if the name makes you think of the face, if you know that face, you do. So that guy is just so good in everything, man. He's, I love, I love that guy's acting. And, um, um, you know, Nicolas Cage comes in. He's like Spider-Man Noir, which I have, I, I love Nicolas Cage. You got, uh, um, uh, John Mulaney plays uh, spider ham, spider pig or whatever. It's just a good movie, man. I'm looking forward to the sequel that they're going to make. And, and so in this one, it's the kid is Miles Morales. Is that right? He, that's who he was. So I believe that the actual MCU is going to be introducing him because wasn't in Far From Home or whatever, or maybe it was Homecoming, but Donald Glover plays what is essentially Miles Morales' uncle in that. So I think at some point you will see a Miles Morales Spider-Man in the MCU. Yeah, no, I think it's... It's it's gonna be, it's 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 a certainty at this point that we will. It's just a matter of how and when, because like you mentioned, not only do they kind of talk about him in Spider-Man: Homecoming, it's where Donald Glover plays Aaron Davis, who is kind of like a character from the comics, his his criminal uncle, Miles Morales' uncle, and especially the way that they're going with the MCU, where they're kind of bringing up all these new young heroes to kind of take over for the Avengers whose contracts have expired and who, whose stories have kind of come to an end. For instance, you have, you know, it's no secret. It's, it's out there from the set photos and from the casting news, but you know, Haley Steinfeld is going to play Kate Bishop. Who's like a disciple of Hawkeye. You know, you have the Miss Marvel show coming out right now in WandaVision. You have, you know, her two young kids who are, heroes and it's like you know you can tell that that's the direction that they're going in where they're gonna have kind of like a young avengers thing come up so you know i think it's absolutely for sure that we'll see miles morales in live action at some point and it'll be interesting to see who plays him a lot of people are calling for caleb mclaughlin who plays uh lucas on stranger things to be cast as him which i think is a pretty good casting but You know, it just depends on what they want to do and how they're going to do it. But, you know, getting back into the Spider-Verse, you know, I think you're right where it's just got a a great voice cast. And I I knew you were going to bring up Nicolas Cage because I know you're a big fan of his. And, you know, I think the way that they did his character, the Spider-Man noir guy was like perfect because it was just Nick Cage being Nick Cage, all, you know, edgy and moody. And, you know, and then you have the juxtaposition of John Mulaney as Spider-Ham is just this goofy Looney Tunes character. And it's just such a well-rounded cast of characters in the movie. And, um, you know, let's not forget about the Peter Parker Spider-Man. You have Jake Johnson as the kind of, you know, main, like, you know, kind of out of shape Spider-Man who's on hard times. And then a lot of people may not know Chris Pine voiced the Spider-Man that dies towards the beginning of the movie. I mean, spoilers, but this was a big movie and it's been out for a few years. So, but you know, it's it's just really such a great movie overall. I, I'd watch that one over and over again. Yeah, it is a great movie, and I'll do my humble brag as I like to do. Jake Johnson, I worked with him. I did an episode of New Girl when I was in LA, and he was a super nice dude. So that's my Jake Johnson story. He was just a nice guy. And watch New Girl season two, episode four. So obviously with, you know, a couple of uh, dead sharks and jars, obviously, you know, sharks and the jars, you know, kind of sounds like it. But my movie pick was Jaws, you know, like had to pick a shark movie. I mean, and what better one since we haven't talked about it yet on the show is Jaws. And this is we talked on a previous episode about if you put together a list of essential movies that people had to see in their lifetime, you know, the the basic collection of you have to see these movies at some point in your life jaws is absolutely on there for me and it's just such a well-made film it still pretty much holds up today keep in mind it was made a a long time ago so some of the effects you know may not be as great but the way it's shot and the way the story is told it's still still great and steven spielberg you know really early on in his career had a lot to prove with this movie and he just knocked it out of the park you know, people saw this and they were afraid to go in the water after watching this this shark movie. So I absolutely love Jaws. I think it's a classic. And, you know, I don't think 
I really hope Hollywood really never tries to remake this one, you know, and call it Jaws. They have made other shark movies, which is fine, but I really hope they just leave this one alone. Yeah, Jaws is one that I'll watch probably usually once a year, maybe once every other year around, you know, summertime. It's a good July 4th movie. Um, it is a classic. The ride that I think they they closed it down or it's not even that ride at Universal anymore, but the Jaws ride was always one of my favorites. Um, yeah, it's just, there's not much you can say. Anybody who's going to be potentially listening to this podcast, they probably know Jaws back to front like we do. It's just a great movie, you know. Obviously, it's infamous for it's uh, the 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 shark broke down so much. The mechanical shark broke down so much on set, which is why you don't see it as much. Which was a blessing in disguise because if you would have seen it more, it wouldn't have been as creepy or as scary. Jaws is a classic example of when people say less is more because because of the shark having mechanical problems, you know, they weren't able to show as much of it as they could but it left more to the imagination where you get these little glimpses of it and a fin or, you know, a shadow in the water. And it just, it leaves so much more to the imagination and it really makes it better for it. And I really wish people would take that lesson to heart in films today where it's a monster movie or a horror movie. And, you know, we get teases before maybe a full reveal kind of closer to the end of the movie of whatever the, the creature or, you know, the monster or the killer is and really kind of use a little bit of a deft hand in crafting something like this where it leaves more to the imagination and it makes the movie better for it overall. So, you know, I think that's absolutely right, is that it's it's a blessing in disguise where the mechanical shark wasn't working that well, so it actually made for a better movie in the end. So I went a different way with it, which is I went to a movie about TSA agents, which for me... One of the all-time great comedies is She's Out of My League. And it's all about, you know, it's about a guy, a schlubby guy who falls in love with just one of the most gorgeous girls ever, Alice Eve. And uh, But in the movie, if you ever saw it, they're all TSA agents. Uh, T.J. Miller has one of my favorite lines where he's just like, where somebody's like, hey, you can't do that. And he's like, TSA, mother effer. <laughs> and that just always, that cracks me up all the time. But, you know, it's just a, just it's just a funny movie. It's one of those movies that flies under the radar, I think, but people who have seen it, I think would all agree. It's one of the funniest movies I think ever. Have you, have you seen it? Yeah, it's, um, it, I, I have seen it and I, I would agree with you. It's a really solid kind of mid two thousands comedy. And, you know, there, there were a handful of them where, you know, they didn't really make hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office, but they were this batch of like solid comedies that came out, in the mid 2000s where, you know, you kind of look at what came out around that time. And we already kind of talked about, you know, forgetting Sarah Marshall has kind of been there and some other Judd Apatow movies as well. But, you know, she's out of my league, I think kind of falls in there as well, where it's a solid rom-com. It's a, it's a funny comedy, you know, Jay Baruchel kind of, I'm not sure if this is the movie he really kind of stepped into the spotlight with, but, you know, he was funny in it because he plays this awkward lanky you know guy who's like the title says is dating way out of his league and you know tj miller uh i think he's funny in this movie i don't think he's funny in every movie and it seems like people are really split on the internet about how funny he really is but you know i think tj miller is funny in this as the best friend and you know there's some other names as well Kristen ritter kind of plays the the best friend of alice eve in the movie and you know i think it's i think it's a solid comedy overall i agree with you on that yeah, I mean, what more can be said? It's great comedy. Go out and watch it. All right, so the next story was what turned out to be a pretty massive story last week, which was Tiger Woods was involved in a car accident. Um, so I just I was uh, I was working at the time, and I got you know I get the ESPN headlines. I just saw Tiger Woods in an accident, in car accident. And then I didn't look, turn on the TV. I didn't, you know, I wasn't searching the internet at the time or anything, but I I got like more, uh, you know, notifications on my phone. And it would just seem like at first it seemed like it was just a minor car accident. And I was just like, why is this such a big deal? It's a car accident or whatever. And then it turned out that, you know, it was pretty massive in terms of like, it seems like this will be the end of his career or 
it'll be the greatest sports comeback story in the history of sports stories. Yeah, so you kind of took the words right out of my mouth with, uh, you know, I was going to say this feels, I think for a lot of people, when they kind of saw this headline or, or got an alert or something that this felt like Kobe Bryant all over again, where a very well-respected kind of top of their game athlete in a sport, all of a sudden you hear about they were in an accident and people are like, what's going on? And you're waiting for developments to come in. And it, it felt like a, you know, it, like it might be another punch in the gut, you know, kind of hearing about this. And, you know, thankfully at the end of the day, um, he wasn't seriously injured. He wasn't drunk driving. It was just an unfortunate accident. The car flipped uh, a few times, but at the end of the day, he had a, a couple surgeries, but he's um, all better better now. You know, he'll make a recovery. And, you know, I think it's an important question about whether or not this will cut his career short. But, you know, thankfully, this wasn't a, a bigger um, accident or event like it was for, for Kobe. So, you know, thankfully, it seems like everybody's walking away from this. Yeah, and it made me think. I don't know if you've ever been in a in a car accident or not, but when I was I was 18 years old, I missed the stop sign going pretty fast. Did a full 360 in my car, hit a curb, stopped. Luckily, uh, my my wheel went went 180. Stopped. When I uh, got out of the car, I looked. I was that far, one inch from heading over. A, a, a curb that led to a pretty steep cliff where I probably would have died if I went over it. So that it made me think of that. So I was like, have you ever been in like any type of car accident like that or anything? Um, no, knock on wood. Uh, I've never have been, yeah. but you know, I know it can be obviously a very scary thing, even if it's a minor accident, which obviously this one was a little bit of a bigger scale of what happened than just a little bit of a fender bender. But you know, even something like that, a low speed accident can still be scary for some people and still kind of have a lasting impact. So, you know, mentally, even if he's physically all right, you know, not sure how this might affect him in the future. Yeah, nah, we'll see. I mean, like I said, it could be one of the greatest sports comeback stories in the history of sports comeback stories if he can come back and, and win a major or something. So with this one, movie wise, Tiger Woods, golf. I just went with one of the greatest – it's the greatest golf movie ever made, but it's probably one of the greatest sports movie I ever made, and that's Caddyshack. I mean, it's just a great movie. It's hilarious. It holds up, what, almost 40 years or over 40 years later. Just just a great flick, man. Yeah, it's – it's. what more can you say about Caddyshack? You know, this was um... – We'll get to my pick in a little bit here, but this was like the other kind of clear cut pick for me relating to this story about a golfer talking about golf movies. But what more can you say about Caddyshack? Um, you know, just the the cast list for that. Uh, Bill Murray, Chevy Chase, Rodney Dangerfield, uh, among others. It's just it's such a classic comedy. And, you know, it's it's wacky. It's, um, you know, the dialogue is funny. There's like plenty of different kinds of humor in it to make people laugh. You know, the little... Um, gopher or you know whatever it is that like that animal i can't remember exactly what it was but you know bill murray just kind of chasing after it and just you know the comedy and man it's just it's it's so classic and you know i guess my question for you would be we were talking about kind of a list of essential movies if you took just comedies if you made an essential list of movies for just comedies would you kind of put caddyshack on there with other ones throughout history Oh, absolutely. <clears throat> absolutely. Yeah. Caddyshack. Caddyshack's a top 10 comedy. If I was to give a top 10, Caddyshack's on that list without a shadow of a doubt. It's, it's not only is it a top 10 comedy, it's one of the original um, comedies in terms of like classic 1970s National Lampoon's era comedy. I mean, and, and the behind the scenes of how this movie got made. I have I have a book about it written by uh, one of the uh, review uh, uh, critics from Entertainment Weekly, Chris Nash, Nash Matthew or something. But he it's uh, the 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 behind the scenes of the story of how this movie got made is almost more legendary than the movie itself. And it's a great read if you ever get a chance. 
Yeah, Caddyshack is one of those ones where, you know, we talked about kind of some mid 2000s comedies already here. And, you know, those maybe stuck with us because we were around to kind of see them when they came out. But the truly great ones like Caddyshack um, stick around because they are such classics and they just endure the test of time. And, you know, when you talk about movies like Caddyshack or say Airplane or other ones from, you know, decades ago that people still love to talk about and watch day in, day out that were born way after they came out. It's because those are, those are the great ones. Those are the ones that people remember and stick around. Yeah, man. So I think I know your pick, but go ahead and give it. Yeah. So the other kind of obvious one for this, I went with the movie, happy Gilmore, obviously, Um, you know, it's one of Adam Sandler's earlier comedies. And in my opinion, one of his better comedies, because we've had this conversation before where, you know, we differ a little bit on where the dip in quality was for the rest of his career. But, you know, I think kind of like Arnold Schwarzenegger a little bit to tie it back. Early Adam Sandler is better Adam Sandler than some of his later stuff. And Happy Gilmore, I think, is a great comedy. You know, it's obviously because it takes place. It's a sports comedy. A lot of it is physical comedy. But, you know, a lot of it is there's so many quotes from the movie, too, that people kind of still throw out there. And, you know. Um, not to take anything away from Adam Sandler, but Christopher McDonald as, you know, Shooter McGavin, his rival in the movie is, is great too. And, you know, he's great for laughs too, because he's trying to, you know, stay on top and keep the game as is and happy as bringing all these changes to it. And, you know, it's just, it's so funny to watch him react to some of the shenanigans that go on and him trying to sabotage happy Gilmore. And, you know, it's just a really good comedy from start to finish. And I think one of, Adam Sandler's better ones that he did. Oh yeah. Yeah. Happy Gilmore. I think it was like his second big movie after Billy Madison. And it's, uh, it's hilarious. It is without a doubt. One of the best you got Chubbs, you got Carl Weathers in there, you know, Paulo Creed in there. Um, as you said, Christopher McDonald, he, he always played kind of the a hole back in the day, back in like those movies he was in dirty work, which is one of my favorites where he was in the a-hole in that one. He played a great a-hole in movies. Um, did you see the recent, because it was the 25th anniversary or something like that, maybe 30th, it was the anniversary. So Adam Sandler, I think last week put out a video of him doing the classic golf shot. And then McDonald came in and did his shooter McGavin thing and everything. And it was a nice little back and forth uh, videos that came out this past week. Yeah, I'll I'll gladly take something like that, like just a little back and forth on the anniversary of a movie between the two stars. And I did see that and I, I got a little kick out of that. But I'll gladly take something over that for like a continuation of a, a past classic instead of Hollywood trying to make another like Happy Gilmore 2, you know, like because that's maybe not what most fans want, but it's what most fans need. Like instead of, you know, compromising the integrity of the first one by making a sequel that's not as good you know like if they would have made it happy gilmore 2 instead i'll just take like a mini reunion like the stars just doing a little like hey happy 25th anniversary here's the golf swing from the movie and you know christopher mcdonald saying hey like you know getting in on it and doing his thing too with like the you know it's it's like i'll gladly take a little something like that instead of a continuation of the story and kind of undermining, you know, the integrity of the first one by making an unnecessary sequel. Yeah, I get that. I get that. And yeah, it was nice seeing them again. And yeah, happy Gilmore. I, I, I love Adam Sandler. So any Adam Sandler movie, even his bad ones, like you said, I think we've talked about it. Even his bad ones, I'll watch just because I like the guy. So to kind of close it out here, um, you know, we've kind of changed the format for the end of the episode a little bit where to kind of start off, we've done a new release kind of in quotes, parentheses, movie of the week. And it was either a big new release that everyone's talking about or a movie that we had seen for the first time. But instead, we're kind of switching it up. We're still going to do both those types, but we've kind of changed it to a movie of the week. So it could just be, you know, kind of option C where it's just a movie that both of us have seen that we haven't seen in a while that we just want to talk about. Not something that we've seen for the first time or some big new release, which there aren't that many these days to talk about anyway. So, um, but with that being said, this is what we're going to talk about a movie that I just saw for the first time this week. And that is the movie Sunshine. 
And, you know, if you've never heard of it, this was a movie that kind of flew under the radar as a sci-fi movie back in the uh, mid 2000s. I believe it came out in 2007. And, you know, it's got a good cast. It's got a lot of familiar faces. In terms of household names, the only one that people might know is Chris Evans, um, kind of on the other side, the leading, you know, I guess kind of biggest name on the female side is Rose Byrne. But it, does, it doesn't exactly have a lot of A-listers in it, but it's still a very well-made and kind of pondering sci-fi movie. And, you know, we'll get into it in a second here. But, you know, overall, just give me your impression of it, because I liked it. I thought it was good. I think, you know, we'll try to avoid spoilers here because it wasn't a super popular movie. It's a little unknown. So, you know, we'll we'll try to avoid spoilers here. But, you know, I thought it was good. It took a, let's just say, a little bit of a turn at one point. You know, we won't get into what it was, but I think overall it was good. I liked how it started and maybe the turn was a, you know a little kind of out of left field but i like from i liked it from start to finish i thought it was a good sci-fi movie with a different kind of premise to it uh yeah i absolutely love sunshine it was <clears throat> one of those again you said you know you're you you're batting a thousand with your movie picks over your last two hosts and gigs because this was one i hadn't seen in a while and you when you sent over your sheet of uh you know, I don't know if anybody knows the concept, but he asked the we we know the beginning question and we know our final movie. The movies in between, we know we only find out when we're doing this. So when you sent that over, I was like, great pick, dude. So I actually ended up watching that two nights ago again. And and to show you how big of a fan I am, I own the script. This is the script for Sunshine. I bought that when it came out because it's a great. It was written by Alex Garland, who went on to direct Ex Machina, Annihilation. He did the show Devs, which was on Hulu. Phenomenal show. Um, I I love the movie. Like you said, the turn, the turn at the uh, in the in the end is a. It was a swing, man. I'm I'm not the biggest fan of that turn, but it didn't ruin the movie for me. It's still it's still a phenomenal movie, and and one of, and it's kind of what I always say. In terms of music, the music in this movie, it fe- for me, it features probably one of the greatest pieces of music ever written, which is uh, John Murphy who did the score. It's called Adagio in D minor, and that's the song. And it's a song that you probably recognize from a million tra- trailers, a million different movies, perhaps when you watch Sunshine for the first time. Like, I know that song. And this is the original place where, where it came from, this movie. And it's 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 so what do you think about the song here right and just to give a little more background because we didn't really talk about the the premise or the synopsis um to put it simply it's a movie where in the future the our sun is kind of dying and it's up to this team of astronauts to go into space and to try to reignite it to save the planet so just to give you a basic idea of what it's about but um to kind of cover some of the stuff that you just mentioned so, you know, Alex Garland, who was behind some of the scripts and some of uh, behind the scenes stuff for obviously Sunshine and then some of the other movies that you mentioned with Ex Machina and Annihilation. And to me, those are really good kind of high concept sci-fi movies where they ask a lot of questions and it's a lot of really kind of big picture themes. But to me, I really love movies like that, like sci-fi movies that make you think a little bit and deal with kind of more vague and concepts that we don't really understand that well in terms of the human race yet. And it's just, you know, really complicated kind of layered messages that some of the movies that he's been behind have, have had. And I really enjoyed that. I really liked how sunshine kind of went into that territory a little bit as well. And I'm with you where this kind of turn doesn't really ruin the movie for me because sometimes when movies do that where they are going one direction and then veer into another that it kind of upsets the rest of the movie and kind of makes it bad in hindsight. And this one I don't think really did that for me, but you know, you hit the nail on the head with the music as well where I was again you took the words out of my mouth where, you know, John Murphy who did the the score for this movie um, you know, one of the other kind of famous pieces of music from this movie, uh, the title of it is a spoiler for one of the characters, but, um, you know, you hit it on the head with the, the D minor uh, song where 
you've definitely heard this as a moviegoer in other trailers and people have made videos with that music as the background. It's just an epic piece of music. And, you know, it's one of my favorites from movies as well. So, you know, there's, there's a lot to like about Sunshine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so you said Alex Garland wrote it and <clears throat> can't forget Danny Boyle is the director. And this was early Danny Boyle before he went on to, to, to you know, win the Oscar for uh, Slumdog and everything. And that guy's, phenomenal director man i don't there hasn't been a movie of his i haven't like genuinely loved um but and talking about the cast as well man yeah you have chris evans and i think this is like chris evans like turned where he did like he was mainly known for like the mainly name he's mainly known for like those early um comedy movies you know he's in not another teen movie he was in fantastic four comedic role and ever this is like his turn into like more serious fare or whatever and it has one of my personal favorite uh, utility players, which is, you know, an actor you see in like a million movies who is just great in all of them. And that's Benedict Wong. Um, you see, you know who I'm talking about. He is, he's one of those actors, man. He shows up in a movie and I'm like, I, I love it. I, it could be a horrible movie. If I see Benedict Wong, I'm like, I like this movie because that guy is just great in everything he does. Yeah, again, I'd never seen this before, and I saw his name kind of on the cast list as the credits were rolling. And I thought, oh, okay, like, cool. I I'm going to enjoy this more because I know he's going to be in it. And for sure, he did a good job in the movie. And, you know, like you said, Chris Evans, you know, this was a good dramatic role for him. And I think he did a good job, too. I mean, really, the whole cast did. L like, let's not, you know, pick and choose here. Like, I think the whole cast did a great job in this one. And... Again, it's a movie that kind of, I think, flew under the radar. And, you know, if you're looking to check it out now, it's actually on Hulu, which is where I watched it. If you're looking to watch it on a platform, if you really want to check this movie out, that's where you'll find it other than, you know, kind of buying it. But, um, you know, Sunshine, if you're into this kind of um, sci-fi with like a little bit of depth to it kind of movies, I would definitely recommend this one. Sunshine came out. 2007 i think so absolutely worth your time so thank you everybody for watching another episode of life imitating movies weekly podcast show here with mitch and brad where we talk about news stories from the past week from across the internet and the movies that we think have already been made that resemble them so thank you all for tuning in uh if you're watching this on youtube the audio links will be down in the description and don't forget to do all the youtube things like subscribe all that type of stuff it really helps us out and really kind of grow our audience. So we really appreciate it. if you're listening, watching. We're on, you know, kind of major platforms like Spotify and iTunes if you're into the audio versions. So, you know, just thank you for uh, checking us out here. And Brad, anything else to say? Nah, man. I enjoy what we're doing, man. I look forward to this every week. Yeah, hopefully we've kind of brought you some new movies to think about, talk about, maybe check out, and we'll be back again Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern with a new episode of Life Imitating Movies.